This video complements the Island Treasures for Caregivers podcast episode called The Dementia Puzzle. I hope you enjoy it. Welcome to Island Treasures, a place to hear caregiving stories from actual caregivers who are walking their own caregiving journey. This podcast is brought to you by Alongside Caregiver Consulting, and I am your host, Alison Van Shee, from Vancouver Island in beautiful British Columbia, Canada. Today's guest shares her caregiving perspective as the daughter and friend of her mom, Marion, who had vascular dementia and other health concerns before she passed away late last year in 2020. The idea of a dementia puzzle originates during this interview as a creative way to explain what happens during caregiving and the losses someone with dementia experiences. Stay tuned to hear how Sue Johnston describes how this would have been helpful for her during her caregiving journey to better understand what she may encounter through the journey with her mom's illness. Join me now as I welcome Sue Johnston. Welcome, Sue. Hi, Allison. Nice to hear from you. Oh, it's great to have you here and being a guest on Island Treasures podcast. Thank you for saying yes. You bet. Let's start with you sharing who you cared for as a caregiver. I cared for my last caregiver job was my mom. I cared for my dad several years ago as well. But it was my mom that I've been most involved with for a number of years. As a for caring for her more than being her companion, it's probably been about four years. Things started slowly, as you know, and then you spend more and more time with who you love, which I did. My mom had vascular dementia with other little health issues thrown in there. Um, she had AFib really bad. That was treated, but it, it was still a, an issue for her. Really, that was her main problem was her health was AFib, which was probably the cause of the vascular dementia. That's mini strokes. She's had a few mini strokes, one right in front of me that was terrifying. But I'd actually like you to talk a bit about that. Yeah, well, my husband and I were over visiting her one afternoon, and we're all just sitting in chairs having a cup of tea and being social. And then she turned to me to say something, and it came out all gobbledygook. It came out like a little bit of And I looked at her and I said, are you all right? She went, (laughs) and I went, oh my goodness, like you're having a stroke. So I immediately ran down to the bathroom and got some aspirin and got her to swallow it. And we took her off to the hospital, but luckily it wasn't a bad one. And she recovered from that physically. You could see what happened with her brain. I, I don't know. It was probably the beginning of the slide. So yeah, it was terrifying. And apparently with the mini strokes, a lot of times your tongue is actually frozen, which is why you can't talk, why you can't stay in sticks, can't get the words out. So that was one of the first events that happened. And I think she had more after that, but I wasn't always there. Oh, how shocking for you to be there and witness that. I was so glad I was, Yeah, you know, that I could get the aspirin into her and off to the hospital, you know, and she may not even have known she was having one if she wasn't speaking. Anyway, so yeah, that was a bit terrifying, but we got over that. <laughs> so. I'm just going to share with the listeners that Sue's mom just recently passed away in December. And this is really tough for Sue to share the story. That's why I'm so grateful that she's doing this. I'd asked her a long time ago if she would share her story while her mom was still with us. And things happen. and. Yep losses happen and I just am so grateful that you're sharing your mom with the listeners today. My mom opened a pet shop back in the early 70s in Comox and that was really my first job is that she somehow convinced me to come and work there and I did for a number of years whether it was in that store or she transitioned to other stores. So we were working companions as well as friends and mother and daughter. So our relationship was pretty deep in a lot of ways. You know, you, you take all those years and then all of a sudden she's gone. It's a big, big hole. 
you were inseparable in many ways, you and your mom. Yeah, we were very good friends. Yeah, mm-hmm. she, she leaned on me a lot, and I guess I did in reverse. I leaned on her too. We both lost our husbands within a year of each other, about twelve years ago. She lost her husband, and I lost mine a year later. As much as that, that was a terrible thing, we had each other for support, and then we together started this grief group for people. Just sort of a easy group like just a talking group they she was actually hospice trained but she really wanted people to be able to share together their experiences and their needs and so we did that for quite a while she was very involved in the community she was a very high achieving postmistress she received the highest honors in postmasters and went on to open up another club in Comox which unfortunately has since folded but she was very, very active in the community, gave a lot of herself, monetary, you know, a lot. And wasn't she just nominated for some prestigious award? She was recognized. Um, she didn't win an, an, an award per se. And unfortunately, she had no idea that she was even nominated or just noticed, right? Yeah. Just, I was proud of her anyway. Mm-hmm. Well, I know that you're proud of her. Yeah. Yeah. So you were your mom's friend and also her caregiver for four solid years, I would say, but you were codependent, it sounds like, for quite a long time. We were. I probably still are to some degree. <laughs> this is really difficult, this adjustment phase for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we had a good friendship. We traveled a lot together. We took some cruises. She would pay for the cruise and I would pay for the excursions. So I always tried to figure out things that she would like to do. Um, one example was we went up to a uh, cruise to Alaska, and mom is a puffin lover. She mm-hmm. loves puffins. So I, there was an excursion just to go see a, a puffin rescue center. So we went to that. She was quite excited to see that. I'm creating actually a little memorial garden, more for me than for anybody, but I have a big puffin that I'm going to put in it. She'd like that. Uh, it's really good to have tributes like that especially as you're trying to transition through it it makes me feel better like I don't I think all of us as humans well I I speak for myself really but we're afraid that we're going to be forgotten once we leave this planet we're done and I want to make sure she's not forgotten so if anybody comes over we're going to see her garden (laughs) I look forward to seeing the puffin garden yes in honor of your mom thanks yeah recognizing the stage of caregiving after your mom has passed away you're in this phase now you were doing so much for her as her caregiver your life was like you said earlier every thought was about how will this impact mom what can I do for mom and now you're having to redefine that role for yourself absolutely so can you talk a little bit about how things are changing if I wasn't with mom, I was always available by phone because she had two very wonderful care aides that helped a lot with her. But there were times they needed me too, just to help with mom. And because it's such a gradual slide with the dementia, I didn't realize how deep she was in it until she was basically going into care. Like it happened so quickly. You know, we all think, well, we just forgot where we put our keys or whatever. And then it becomes a fearful thing of, oh, no, you know, am I, am I going to be losing my memory? It's scary. So, and mom was an advocate for going on the computer and doing uh, memory games. Like she was very well aware that she was losing a bit of her memory. When she went into the care facility, which in these times in COVID was difficult on so many levels, that was an adjustment where she wasn't home anymore. And then it was, we had to empty her apartment and sell or give away all these things that meant so much to her. And that was, that was difficult, you know, that she had furniture that she thought was worth a million dollars, but you know, sold for five. So that was an adjustment period there of even just going, even now going past her apartment and know she's not there. Mm-hmm. And then going into the care facility, I was only allowed 45 minutes a week. That was hard on everybody. Uh, And with COVID, you know, you have to understand that. But for her, she was, you know, surrounded by care aides most of the time or myself or my sister would go over once in a while. And 
than to go somewhere where she doesn't know anybody. There's no family because we're not allowed in. So that was an adjustment period for all of us to deal with that. And then when she passed away, which came fairly quickly, the only thing is like I have this big hole in my, my life mm. that I need to fill. And I don't want to fill it. I want it to be her. You want her but, to still be here. Yeah. So yeah, so now I'm busy on some levels for her doing her estate. So there's lots to do with that, but that's constantly a, a bringing up of emotions as well. Right? Of course. It's totally different, but I'm trying to take a page from her life and apply it to mine, which, you know, is doing some community things or getting out in the garden more, or, you know, I'm just trying to take some pieces of her that were very valuable and apply them. And I can't go wrong doing that. Sounds like that's going to bring you joy, the joy that you need right now. I think so. And if I can help other people in similar same situations, whether it be dementia or just a carry to somebody, I mean, just have a coffee with them. I'm up for that anytime. So just investing in people. But yeah, I've always been that way. You're finding joy by taking a page out of your mom's life and applying it to yourself. And you are helping folks. You're listening to folks. You give people time. You listen. They gave me time too. So mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. We all need each other, whether we want to admit it or not. We need each other. And we all have different opinions and values, and we can take or leave whatever we need, but we do need each other. Mm -hmm. and, and that's been really tough during COVID, hasn't it? That it's we... been really tough. Yeah. And I think that's the part that was tragic for me was that mom needed people. Unfortunately, it's a different subject, but she transitioned into the anger stage and that made it very difficult. Mm -hmm. It's difficult as a daughter, as the child, because you become the parent as my mom sunk further into dementia, caring for her. But there were always little sparks of, of her that would come out, right? And she was never really an angry person. She could be angry once in a while, but she was very quickly to have it blow over. So when she uh, sunk into this, anger side of things it was totally foreign to me on even how to deal with it my first instinct is to strike back when somebody is talking to me in not a nice way which of course I wouldn't do with her but it's okay now how do I process this and how do I respond and you have to think of that in 15 seconds or less because you're right in the middle of that situation that was a tough one and I don't know that I mastered that very well it came on so quick and I only had her for a short time after that but I never really figured out. I knew that I just had to respect it and understand it, but it hurt in a lot of a lot of areas. It hurt because she she was totally foreign to me at that point. She was totally different. And your mom being angry with you takes you back to being four years old. It's like, well, don't, don't be mad at me. And I didn't want her to be mad at me, but she was. But she wasn't mad at me. She was just angry. And it was her illness that was making yeah. her be that way it was not yeah. personal directed at me and then it started getting directed at her carried and then again in care with the ladies down there yeah that was a difficult one to adjust to and I feel bad for anybody going through that and yet there was the other side of it where she had such a she used to laugh all the time at everything which that was the other side the dark side came in because she was always a giggler she always laughed at everything. If anything, it drove me nuts that she laughed so much. <laughs> and then that disappeared overnight. She lost her laugh and oh, became angry. Wow. So yeah, it was a difficult adjustment to me, for sure. That sounds like something you wouldn't expect either. One moment, the humor and the fun times are gone and gone for good and replaced by something horrible. Totally foreign. And like you say, you revert back to being a child. Your inner child is going, my mom is mad at me. Yeah. What Even did I do? Was, you know, <laughs> but still, it was still, there's still a feeling. And I come home feeling more despair because I didn't feel helpful at all. Yeah, it's a really difficult journey. So difficult. And you were really struggling when your mom was in the care home mm -hmm. that, uh, you were only given the 45 minutes each time for a visit, and much of that was spent in anger, and you were questioning, should I be there? Well, I yeah, I actually stopped going for about three weeks because I thought, well, maybe she needs some time to adjust and get to know these ladies. And if I'm a reminder of her life as she knows it, 
I'm causing some of the anger, not intentionally, but that's a button that got pushed on her. So I backed off regrettably now because the anger didn't change and she had very little time left that we didn't know. I was very, very fortunate that I got a window the, the week before she passed away and she was very angry when we came to see her. She loved getting gifts. That was just, she just almost sat on a throne and loved to get all this stuff given to her. So I went down and I bought her one of those big, thick Costco soft, fluffy blankets and a new top that was, the material was beautiful. So I took it down there and the nurse came in with me to her room and we basically hugged the wall for about the first 15 minutes while she threatened to hit us and all these awful things that were not her. And I gave her a blanket and the, uh, the lady said, oh, look, your daughter brought you a lovely blanket. She picked the blanket up and threw it at me and said, she's not my daughter. My daughter wouldn't do that. Hmm. So I knew she didn't know who I was, which was a bit of a, a relief in some ways that she wasn't angry at me. Right. So uh, anyways, I ended up putting the blanket back on the bed beside her. The nurse left and I gave her the blouse and she took it and she was going to throw it at me. But she felt the material mm. and it had sparkles on it and she hid it. She put it under a pillow. Mm. So I knew she loved it. Yeah. And then the blanket she tucked in behind her. I was happy to see that. And then she just closed her eyes and sort of went to sleep. So I just sat in the chair beside her. And then she looked up and she went, Sue? Mm. And I went, hi. And she said, oh, she said, I'm so happy to see you. And she held her hands out to me. And then she said, I'm so angry. And I said, I know you are, and I'm really sorry you are. And if I could change that, I would, you know. And then she just put her head back down and, and went back to sleep. So I was very grateful that I had that window. That wonderful moment. That was my last window. So that was a very of... meaningful, timely moment for you. Yeah. I just felt like I was putting a little bit of my love on her in the blanket. Right? Yes. So, yeah, oh, the symbolism up. with that blanket now. <laughs> I have it now. I wrap myself up in it quite a bit. So, yeah, I knew she knew I loved her. And she used to tell me that she loved me a lot until the last month or two. I knew she knew that. And I think the fact that she also entrusted me with her bank accounts, with everything. Like, I became the one for her. And she never, ever questioned what I did. So I, I was honored, you know, that she trusted me that much. So that's pretty nice. That's the trust factor. But then when you were in the actual relationship world, that was a totally different way for her. That's the illness. And that's just how yeah, it progresses. It's tragic. It is tragic. And I think the lesson too that I had to learn was that I would try and change somebody from that anger to the giggle again or convince her to eat her dinner because she'd stopped wanting to eat. That you can't change. You have to just accept and honor. And that was difficult for me because I'm a bit of a controller so it was really hard for me just to let go I wouldn't say I was super always successful at it it's just believing like she would tell me that she owned four apartments in her building she believed that and I wasn't going to take that away from her no that's her and reality she's not hurting anybody no anything that she said I just went great wonderful yeah. I've heard some talk of, from people who go through this a bit that they you know, that you're angry because somebody's lying to them. Like everybody's reality is so different and their reality is completely different now than ours is. There's no educating someone with dementia. They're incapable. They're sick. Their brain is sick. If somebody was in pain and they had cancer and they had a really bad pain, we wouldn't try and tell them it's not there. Yeah. You need to just accept and honor that and help in any way you can. Yeah, so I love that you say that. The lessons that you're learning is you recognize that you wanted to change her. You wanted to change the anger back to the giggling, but you recognize that you can't change it. And you chose to accept and honor, honor yeah. her, honor the changes. Yeah. Yeah. She lovely. would have been devastated to know that she was behaving in a certain way. She lost her filters a few times, talking in a way that was foreign to my mom. But she still had generosity. We were in our local grocery store and we're shopping. She was terrible. She always disappeared on me when we were shopping. I would turn around and pick up a can. I turn around, she's gone. Like she just <laughs> off in her own world, traveling around the store. And this fellow had come in who was in a, a little scooter. And he had over his lap 
the old fashioned logger jackets, but it was all torn. The stuffing was falling out and, and he looked cold. And I said to mom, oh, that poor guy, he looks chilly, he needs a blanket. Well, get him one. So she took off with her cart and I'm running behind her. And she picks up, which I believe was a bed quilt, all in a package and went and found him and said, here, I want to give you this blanket. Oh. So he was a little shocked, I think, and just sort of said, thank you. And then mom took off the other way and I followed her. And then I went, um, wait a minute. I went back and he's gone. He's not in the store anymore. So he's off gone with this blanket and it's not paid for. <laughs> because mom <laughs> just gave it to him. That's what her brain is here. I'll just take it and give it to you. So, oh, I mean, that was her, we fixed it in the end, but it was yeah. just kind of funny. I said, mom, we need to pay for that. Yeah. You got to scan it and it's gone. Yeah. So, but her priority was meeting his need for right. warmth, not knowing the next step was, oh yeah, we have to pay for that. That's yeah. right. Oh, that's so, a great I don't know. Story. He wheeled off one of there really quickly with his new blanket. Yeah. So. Oh, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> but that oh, was just the spirit, you know, that was oh, usually what, very lovely. warm. Other than that, you know, it's interesting with dementia. Some people, you know, there's, my mom was never a drinker. She quit smoking 35 years ago. Uh, she was a terrible chocolateaholic. So her diet wasn't always the best. But I found that interesting towards the end. She wasn't interested in that either. She wasn't interested in chocolate? No. And I find this interesting just in the caregiving side, if it helps anybody else, is that the last mm, three weeks, I guess, before she ended up going into care was when I was going to say, oh, I have to, I'm going to go home now. She'd go, oh, you know, well, I'm going to miss you. And it was like, okay. There was no more want you to stay. It was like, okay. Oh. And then she didn't want to eat. It was like in some part of her brain, she was starting to let go of things and tired, I think. She always was tired. And I can imagine how exhausting it must be to battle within your own head. And she would say, what's wrong with me? Like, mm. I don't understand. And if you do see somebody in that position where they're not wanting to eat, where they're more accepting of you leaving or... The emotion is kind of scaled back a bit. That to me is a bit of a warning sign of that perhaps they are tired and whether you can help at that point, who knows, but it's recognizing that segment and understanding it. And I didn't really understand it all the way I do. When she passed, I, it was more clear. That's what was happening. But at the time I kind of wondered. So you're reflecting yeah. on what you saw, the changes in her the different behavior and now you're putting mm -hmm. the pieces together and seeing that she yeah. was letting go someone should create a dementia puzzle you know <laughs> i don't know how i would even do it it would be kind of a cool thing for families to have pieces of puzzles that they could say okay we're we, we're using this piece now what pieces are left mm -hmm. what might be i don't know how that could work but some some kind of assistance for those well, watching these ideas they generate creativity. You're mentioning that somebody else might be listening and go, ooh, that's a great idea that I could build on that. This is a dimension mm -hmm. puzzle for family. So each piece has got something maybe written on it as to what is going on in their journey. You know, it's like, okay, so um, mom is forgetting to take her pills. That's one piece of the puzzle that I'm going to put in there. So we know that's part of it. And then the next thing that she does, it may not even all fit. It could be an abstract puzzle that doesn't have square edges, but it just all fits together. And then in the end, you can go back and look and learn and maybe show or, or pass on to somebody else. Because it is a big journey for family, you know, not just the person with dementia. It's a huge learning curve. And... I mean, I did a lot of reading and research just trying to understand what was going on. I think if I'd had a little section maybe to fill in, it's like, okay, this is what's happening. This is what's supposed to happen because it's clinically proved that this is what's going to go on. It was a bit of therapy maybe would mm. have been good for me. And I could maybe add to the puzzle at, through my journey. And the next person that gets it can add their piece. It could be kind of interesting. I just think that's a neat idea, and I'd like to explore that more.
And maybe in the beginning of dementia, the person who has the dementia could be part of the puzzle themselves and say, yeah, that's what I'm feeling now or something. So, because in the beginning, nobody wants to admit it's happening and they, they like, any diagnosis of something wrong, we just want to dismiss. But once we accept it, then there are tools we can use to help us along the journey. Mom would ask me repeatedly what was wrong and am I going to get better? And I did a little bit of a white lie when it came to her going into care because she was adamant about not going into care. So it was really hard for me to put her into care, but it was the only feasible thing left because if she was dangerous to herself and dangerous to other people. So she had to go. She had her doctors come and tell her that they were going to admit her back up a bit. I did a little sidebar with doctors and said, if you tell her she's going into long-term care or assisted living, you're going to get a fight mm -hmm. because she still remembers that she doesn't want to go. So if I could suggest to you that you're going to admit her to a place where they're going to help fix her brain. So they said, we want to send you to a place that will help fix your brain. I knew I was not telling the truth, but it gave her something to hold on to that she was going somewhere to get help. I think that that is a really helpful approach because your mom is a very wise woman. She knew what she wanted. Like you said, she'd been telling you all along, don't put me into long-term care. I don't ever want to go into one of those places. And she knew which places not to go into. But for her own health, her own well-being. She had to be there. Yeah, she had to be there. And yet you found a way to make it something that she could say, if I'm getting my brain looked at and that will help me, then yes, I want to do that. And then, lo and behold, she's in long-term care. But Yeah, she was angry. As soon as we got there, she knew. Yeah. And she didn't want to go in, but... I just kept reiterating, you know, well, you know, I'm going to look after your dog for a few weeks while you're in here, like those kind of things, just so that she would let go of being abandoned. That was how we carried on, I think. But I think that's a helpful tip. Kindness is way better than saying too bad you're in here, if you're yeah. sick, you know, whatever. But it's and, a it, hard and the journey decision. for the caregiver at that point, because it's been arduous, it's been tough, it's been sad, it's been angry, it's been all kinds of mixed emotions. In some ways, it's such a relief that this person is now somewhere where they're going to get 24-hour care. And you are wrestling with guilt of putting them there. But, you know, it, it's a difficult thing to come to terms with for anybody, you know, whether it be your husband, wife, child. It's tough, but if we do it with kindness and maybe not label it, it might be simpler for people. Yeah, you, you mentioned the guilt, and I know that the sense of betrayal is heavy on your heart too. Overshadowing that, you need to focus on it's best for your mom. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And that's easy to say, but it is. <laughs> I, really felt, I really felt like I let her down, yeah. but I know in my own heart that she would never want me to be hurt. If she knew she was hurting me, she would have said, I'm going into care, so I don't do that. <laughs> you know, so, But because I think a lot of our parents that are in their 80s, 90s, maybe even 70s, remember long-term care as these old facilities where you basically have a bed, a TV in your room, and a dinner tray thrown at you, and no company. And that's what they envision, not the opportunity, if they're able to associate and have fun with other people and play games and, you know, watch TV together, share dinners together. It's a different world now than when their parents were in long-term care. Their understanding was much more clinical, much more institutionalized. And both of her parents, well, her dad and her mother-in-law both ended up in Glacier View way many many years ago when it was more an old folks home yeah and she was adamant totally adamant that she was never going to glacier view and yet she was on the board of glacier view to help them for many years you know i'm going to take you back to this puzzle because <laughs> i'm just thinking every caregiving journey is different so everybody's puzzle would be different you've sown a seed here sue this is maybe not a good thing but i like the idea I think you could just even do it on paper. 
you know, of all of the things that may happen with your loved one that has dementia, what, whatever kind of dementia it is. And if they're all just chunks of paper and you pull one out and go, oh my gosh, we're in the middle of this now. It helps identify for yourself where this person is and how you can best help or, you know, at that point too. Yeah. And then you can go to the doctor and say, okay, we're in this now. <laughs> it's identified, it's on paper. You know, it's clear, it's black and white. I think it could be an interesting tool to use. Well, and I know you're well aware, too, of the stages of caregiving and the progression of dementia. You have that awareness already. So to put strategies to each of the stages would really be beneficial. And that's Hopefully, kind of what yeah. you're saying. Yeah. And because I found when mom went through different stages or something new cropped up, I didn't know if it was here to stay right. or if it was temporary. So if I had that little piece of paper that said, okay, she's done this. And it's still there in a month that's here to stay you know what i mean it, it's yeah. just gives you a clearer picture yeah of... well and then your experience too with how quick the giggles went away and and yeah. how quick the next phase came and that's kind and of a they, stark reality stages. yeah i mean delirium came in i mean that's a difficult one to deal with because you can't see or hear what they're thinking you know, and, and she loved her little dog. And I don't want to ever, ever say anything bad about my mom ever. because She was an animal lover, totally, and loved her little dog. But in the end, she was getting mad at her little dog. Did you see him do that? So, and then he hadn't done anything, but her brain saw something. So delirium was a really difficult one to work with. There's medications for that too, but, and that's the other issue, you know, is that more and more drugs came into the picture as she started having delirium, as she was having leg pain, as she was getting more mixed up, as she had AFib, if she had, you know, and more and more pills. And how does that factor in to somebody's brain working? I, at one point, was very serious about bringing her to live with us. And in hindsight, I'm sad, but I'm grateful I didn't because she started doing things like ripping up pictures and breaking glass and it was just really odd taking scissors to clothing her shoes I knew that my home probably would have been next on that one she would have been cutting up things here so we had to start removing things like scissors and knives like they all came out of the apartment couldn't even leave sewing needles you know these are all things that people aren't aware that can happen the so odd behaviors yeah. yeah even if each person who had a dementia journey with a loved one had a list, did a list themselves of what they saw and actions that they saw, they recorded. And this a little even book could be put together in a non-structured way, like a, a literary book, but just a, a pamphlet that can be handed out and saying, this is what I experienced. And you can check that off instead of a puzzle. You could do that because these are all things that were all foreign to me. But if I had seen that it was part of the journey, I might not have been as upset. I would have understood that it's part of the journey. It's not her being angry. For you to recognize that it would have helped you, mm. you also know that it would help other people that are just starting their caregiving journey. And this is why this is so important to share. Yes, it is. You know, and I, I feel for the families. I feel definitely for the dementia person or the Alzheimer's victim or a cancer patient, anybody who is ill in any way. The stress to the caregiver is immense especially if you're a fully involved caregiver and, and part of the family, it's tougher when you're family, you know, if you're a care aide, you do get attached to your person, but it's not the same. So you can decipher, you can say, no, don't do that. Stop. Or if I said it, I would probably get in trouble. So, <laughs> you know, it, it was interesting. And the, uh, the care aides, we can talk about that because you had two em lovely care employed aides. care aides for your mom. And your family, they kind of were like family, but yes. they could go home at the end of the day and you would be the one that would always have to respond. Yeah. But let's talk a little bit about the care aides and how mm -hmm. they benefited the caregiving situation. Well, it all started, of course, with most of it, you know, that she would forget to take her pills or, you know, I did it by phone for a long time. I would just phone her at five o'clock every night say okay which pills do you need like that kind of thing and then after a while she would start dropping them or losing them or not taking all of them so we needed to put something in place to make sure 
So that's when I hired the Carrie. Then she was part of that, which was nice. And it's nice if your loved one can be part of who's going to care for them because it's their life that's being impacted more than anyone else. Uh, and there were a couple Carries that we had to let go that she did not like before we settled on the two that she did. And that was her prerogative. And she said, I don't like that one. I don't, and she hit me or she pushed me. Whether it was true or not didn't matter. Yeah. It was her life. So yeah. we would move on. And once we found the two that were probably the last couple of years, you know, she was content. She trusted them. That was the main thing. And mom was a giver. I had to watch because she'd give away all the family jewelry to everybody. <laughs> like, Here, you have this. But mom, that was a diamond from my great great grandmother. So maybe you shouldn't give that away. Oh. But a good care aide will come and tell you this, yeah. which they did. Your mom tried to give me this, put it somewhere so she thinks it's gone. But <laughs> so that's, you know, a definition there. Um, they slowly had to come on board to helping her with bathing. And she, was, uh, she wasn't that proud. It was just like, oh, well, whatever. If you're going to see me, you're going to see me. So she didn't like it. She would fight it sometimes. And then things evolved with things like very care. And because with dementia, you don't think anymore. Of, and it's, and I don't, again, I don't want to disrespect my mom because I'm not. I just, mm -hmm. that you forget that you hadn't changed your underwear in three days. It, it didn't matter to you, but it, it does. So you need people in place that can help assist with that. So she started having other little issues, you know, that way. So they would come. She had her dinner made for her at her, her semi-assisted living was included dinner, but it didn't include breakfast and lunch. So the girls now started coming and preparing her breakfast so, because she was bad and have chocolate cookies for breakfast. <laughs> of course it, she did. A little more substantial. <laughs> So, and then that evolved, that helped them evolve a friendship with her because they're there a bit more often and they're cooking and they're take, they're going shopping and they're asking her, what does she want to eat? And what, so she became part of it, which was very helpful and heartwarming. Right? So that became more and more. And then when COVID hit, of course, she couldn't go downstairs anymore. And then when it came time that she could, she'd forgotten how to use a knife and fork she wouldn't eat she'd just stare into space or so she needed assistance with her meals they were made for her and brought to her but somebody needed to be there with her to make sure she ate it which mm -hmm. in the last few weeks she decided she wouldn't uh, so that became important so then it became coming and helping her get ready for bed so they would you know hopefully have a bath and then get her in her pajamas and set up in her bedroom with her little dog and a snack and a tv on and then she, we were comfortable in leaving her for the evening once all the knives and scissors were gone. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's quite a journey. It's, you know, all these things are an adjustment. And, and she became- It's nonstop for you. Like that's the piece, it's nonstop, ongoing. It's nonstop. And, you know, mom was fortunate that she could afford to carry mm -hmm. to the extent that she did. And they were so good to her. You know, they would take her for drives every now and again. And yeah, so they became very important in recognizing different things happening with mom. So whether it was delusions or anger or crying, because she, she got very, very sad in the end. She mm -hmm. cried all the time. They could relay that to me and I could relay that back to the doctors. So the carries were your eyes on your mom to see the changes that were happening. Absolutely. And then you would yeah. relay that information yeah. to the medical professionals and just be able to provide yeah. the best care for your mom. They were important to me. Because they were so caring, they were always asking how I was. And they still reach out and make sure I'm okay. And that's pretty special. Yet that's above and beyond. That just speaks to who they are. Another yeah. thing, I keep going back to this puzzle. Another thing you would put on your mom's <laughs> puzzle is crying. Because that became a new thing too. Yeah. No, oh, I love gosh, this idea. Yeah. It was nonstop. Wow. The last couple of months was just this whole different person emerged. And I think there was some awareness in her that she knew she was declining quickly and she was very depressed. And even though they put her on antidepressants along with all the other stuff, it didn't do anything. So she was in the last while either angry or crying. And then that's difficult yeah. to 
adjust to yourself. You don't know what role you need to be that day, whether you're the sympathizer and hugging and cuddling or you're standing against the wall trying not to get hit. <laughs> you just never know. And you had a fair drive to even go to visit your mom and then to not know what was going to await you. <laughs> it was kind of like, oh. And I'll be honest, the last couple of months, it was difficult going out to visit her because we weren't relating anymore. Our relationship had disappeared, the one I knew. It was really hard to go out there because she didn't want to do anything anymore. Didn't want to go out, didn't want to drive. I used to stay the night at her place. She used to stay at mine, but she didn't want to do anything like that anymore. Yeah, it it, it it a bit of guilt, but at the same time, I can say it with dementia. She didn't remember that I wasn't there, or else I would go and I would go like for three days in a row, and she'd say she hadn't seen me in two weeks. Yeah. So I knew, you know, my visits were important, but the carries became more important than I was, and I appreciated that. You know, it's understandable. There's only so many things I was capable of doing, and they could do do more. So my role changed more of an observer than a doer. That's just the way it goes. This is quite the journey. Yeah. Yeah, it is, you know, especially when it's your mom. And my mom was a very, very intelligent woman, just involved in so many things. And to see that person disappear was very difficult. The shell was there, but the inner bone was a shadow of herself. The other thing, too which was interesting was my mom was getting pretty hefty in her chocolate days and she wasn't doing anything anymore. So she had put on a fair bit of weight, but then when the crying started and she wasn't eating, she was dropping weight really quickly. So it made me wonder if there was something else going on in her body that we didn't know. Uh, yeah. You know? So the week before she passed away, when I talked to her, she had lost weight. But the following week, when she did pass away, she had lost a good 30 pounds in a week. What yeah, does that? That's shocking. Yeah. But why did that happen? You know? And that's probably a question of whether or not anybody else in their journey, in some ways, I wish I'd asked for an autopsy because I don't really know what killed her. What was it? Did she just give up and, or did she have something else go on? I wrestle with that because I don't know. So if it's something that anybody else is going through and you know, we don't want to think about that, if it helps give some closure, I think it's important. And I didn't get that closure and I still wonder. So there's another piece to the puzzle. That puzzle. So anyway, Sue, that, how hmm? are you taking care of yourself? Oh, I, I go for a walk every day. We, I go with a friend. We do 6K every day. As many times as we can if the weather is good. And I'm now starting to get in my garden. I'm starting to pick up a book again. I wasn't able to read for a long time. I just couldn't concentrate. And I still have trouble. And I know that's part of the grief. You know, it took me a long time to allow myself to sit in a chair. Like at one in the afternoon. And if I felt like it, put a movie on at three. I was always out of bed at seven. I never put the TV on till the news. And I was always busy. And now I've given myself permission to actually sit. And it's foreign and I do struggle. But in other ways, it feels good. You so, give yourself permission to relax. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, because my my dad, I was care for him too. He was unfortunately quite sick. So that was a that was another a whole different story. But. That was another podcast. <laughs> yeah. So for the last probably 20 years, it's been caring for my parents and I have not begrudged it, but it's like, now what do I do? Yeah. And to think now I'm the matriarch of the family. That's yeah. scary. I know. You have shared some great insights and some pain and some suggestions like considering an autopsy when it's not something anybody really wants to think about, but no. that's a consideration you've offered folks to think about. I think, too, is that I recognize now in the last six months that she was always trying to give me something, always trying to give me a piece of jewelry. And I think I should have honored that more because I didn't want to think that she wasn't going to be here. So I'm not taking your jewelry. It's yours. But she wanted to do that. So if you have a loved one that really, you know, well and wants to give you something, take it. She wanted the joy of seeing you receive it from her. Yeah. But I'll finish on it. A note that she had a ring made, a diamond ring made for herself. And she had had surgery. And when she, after she had surgery, her memory, I think a lot of that started from surgeries. 
she gave me her ring after her surgery. She said, I want you to have this ring. And I'm going, well, mom, you just had surgery, you know, like maybe let's just wait for a couple. No, I want you to have it. So I have the ring. And then I'm picking her up maybe a month later and we're going shopping and I'm driving and she sees the ring on my hand. Oh, how did you get my ring? And I said, well, actually, mom, you gave it to me. I did. I said, would you like it back? Yes, I would. <laughs> <laughs> I now have it again, but it was just funny that that's that's the filters that disappear. Oh, that, that's adorable, know. though, that but, she felt comfortable enough. Yes, I I would like it back. <laughs> not only that, but I said to her one day, "Oh, your dog is starting to put some weight on, Mom." She says, "Have you looked in the mirror lately?" <gasps> <laughs> that's the filters that disappear. There we go. Oh my happen. goodness. <laughs> That's great that you can laugh about that. Yes. That's Laughter awesome. is a great healer. It is. So you have shared, like I said, some wonderful wisdom today. And okay. I want to thank you. Well, thank you. And I'm glad you're doing this to help others because there's so many of them out there. They need the help. So bless you. Bless you too. And you've been a real encouragement to me all along. I thank you. so many parts of the dementia journey that could be part of Sue and Marion's dementia puzzle. If you find yourself needing to make your own dementia puzzle to get a clear idea of what you're experiencing in your caregiving journey, and you find you need supports as a caregiver, tap into Alongside Caregiver Consulting as a resource at www.alongsidecaregiverconsulting.ca or on Alongside Caregiver Consulting's Facebook page or Instagram account. If you'd like to share your story as a guest on the Island Treasures podcast, please contact me by email either through my website or by email at alongsidecaregiverconsulting at shaw.ca. And thank you for tuning in today and listening to Sue's caregiving story and to Sue Johnston for sharing her insights and wisdom, which I'm sure you found helpful. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you.